Hey there, Autism Fitness founder Eric Chesson, leading the movement for movement, bringing you another edition of Autism Fitness Tuesday training and treating a head wound with a couple of band-aids. People, do not close the trunk of your SUV onto your head. That is a public service announcement. Um, be focused on what you're doing. <laughs> Anyway, beyond that and non-concussed, I bring you another edition of Autism Fitness Tuesday training. This is the second time I said that I re re realize that I am being redundant. And this is going to be, I think, an, an interesting one because it comes back to one of my favorite topics to cover, the dis demystification process of expectations and setting expectations and putting things into very plain, sensible, straightforward, logical language in terms of what expectations should be around skill acquisition with respect to exercises and when we're going to see um, any type of training effect, which of course is what we are after in, in developing and implementing resistance-based fitness training programs for our autism and neurodivergent population and what we need to take into account is that everybody is going to be starting at a slightly different or widely different place on that continuum of skill development. And we can also bring it back to the standard operating system of autism fitness, the PAC profile. So every athlete that you work with is probably going to be in a little bit different place as far as their physical capabilities with each exercise, their adaptive capabilities as far as, far as their motivation and engagement with each particular exercise, and of course their cognitive skills, their, um, their communication, their reception, their uh, short-term and long-term memory, and of course neuromuscular functioning, their ability to motor imitate and control their uh, their range of motion and the performance of each exercise from a motor learning perspective. And there you have it, that's everything. Now, so from the PAC profile perspective, very difficult phrase to say, you have to take into account that everybody is going to be a little bit different and that is going to influence our expectations. Now, when we talk about physical functioning in, in the context of when are we going to see results with a particular athlete, it depends on when they are starting and a number of, of other factors. All right, so I will break them down. The expectation is that eventually through fitness, uh, particularly talking about resistance-based training, through fitness-based training, our autism and neurodivergent athletes are going to develop physical strength, stability, motor planning that is going to transcend or generalize the fitness session and show up in other areas of activities of daily living or other areas of life. That is the goal of our general training. And of course, if they're playing a sport or have some other uh, athletic or physical pursuit outside of that, the general strength and fitness training is going to help. And we it may be applicable to, um, to some of those sports or activities, but that's where we have to start asking much more pointed and, and specific questions, right? With the development of the training effect for each athlete, the questions that we need to ask are, number one, what is the athlete's baseline with that particular exercise? So whether we're talking about a squat or a press or a cable row or a standing band row or a carry, where are they starting at, right? What is their baseline? And essentially, we have three, sometimes four phases for each athlete. So we have an introductory phase where we are introducing the exercise. They've probably never done the squat before, or they they have squatted in their life, but they've never done it as a structured uh, fitness activity or a strength-based exercise. So that's number one. The introductory phase is just as as it is as it as its nomenclature. It is the beginning of training for our 
athlete, whether they are completely new to the program um, or whether they've had a, a fitness program in the past or an adapted PE program that focused on general movement, this may be the first time that they're getting this exercise in a structured acti- uh, in a structured format, or it ha- might have been a very long time since they have done this exercise in a structured format, thereby ba- basically uh, meaning that they are doing this for more or less the first time. So in that introductory phase, we may also have an athlete who is not yet adept at that exercise because of course we know it takes time for many of our autism and neurodivergent life skill athletes to develop the range of motion, the motor control, especially on that eccentric component of the exercise that builds the most muscle, that builds the most strength. So the introductory phase is going to be dependent, the length of that introductory phase is going to be dependent on that particular athlete's current baseline skills. It could be one session, it could be 10 sessions, it could be 10 months of sessions for a particular athlete. We also have to take into account how many sessions are we doing per week with that uh, with that athlete. If we're getting one session in, it's probably going to take a little bit longer. If we're getting two sessions in, well, it's double, so it'll likely take I won't say exactly half the time because we don't know, but much less time because the athlete is getting more more practice and more coaching with that particular exercise or those particular exercises. So that's our introductory phase. After the introductory phase, we have this accumulation phase. In the accumulation phase, we typically, from an adaptive or motivational perspective, we have more buy-in, we have more focus from the athlete. The athlete is familiar with the exercises, familiar with the environment, familiar with the coaching, so that previous where we might have been doing two sets of the squat or the overhead press or that sandbag carry in the last session, now we're up to three sets and four sets. So simply by way of the athlete being more engaged um, and, and more motivated to perform the exercises, we're doubling or even in some cases tripling the amount of volume, the total sets and repetitions that they have during their session. This is great because it's going to lead to greater skill acquisition and it's going to lead to a greater training effect. So that athlete is going to get stronger and is going to develop uh, more of, of that musculature faster than if they were doing two sets of that exercise once a week. So now they're doing four sets of that exercise once a week. So the the math there is very simple and it's uh, creating more of a challenge for the body. Body has to respond by developing strength, developing musculature, all of the things being equal. So that accumulation phase, an athlete can be in that accumulation phase for a long time, especially when we consider some of the motor planning issues and some of the uh, muscular strength deficits that we often see Um, some of the motor skill deficits or motor control deficits that we see with many of our neurodivergent athletes. So if they are starting at a modified level of any particular exercise, then they are going to need more practice until they meet what we call in autism fitness world, uh, what we call the standard. Standard performance of that exercise means that the athlete can perform it safely and effectively and independently. Um, and that's where they're really going to get a training effect out of that exercise. Uh, we have a saying in the autism fitness uh, pro certification that squatting is not bouncing um, and bouncing is not squatting. So if the athlete is bouncing up and down to the, to the platform or to the bench or to whatever they're using for that squat, it negates most of the beneficial effects of that squat, if not all the beneficial effects of that squat. So it's something that we want to be uh, aware of and and uh, and coaching around so that the athlete is performing the best possible quality version of their squat. So we have our introductory phase, we have our accumulation phase, and then we get into a mastery phase. Um, in the mastery phase, the athlete is practically or completely independent with that exercise. They have great control of the movement. They're doing enough sets and repetitions 
of that exercise. So they're getting their three to even five sets of that overhead press or three to even five sets, even six sets sometimes, but generally three to five sets of that standing band row or that cable row, three to five sets of those farmer's walks. So now we have a, a situation in which the athlete has great motor control, they have great range of motion, they're performing the exercise independently, and now we're really starting to uh, see the development of strength of motor control <clears throat> and maybe even of some musculature as well. So the expectation is not always that, uh, that within six weeks or within eight weeks or within 10 weeks, something is, or something big is going to happen. This is a steady process and it is highly dependent on total time training, on the quality of the training, on the engagement of the athlete. And, you know, if, if we think about, it, it, it's funny, but this seems to, uh, to occupy a completely different realm of thought and it shouldn't. If you think about a, um, a neurotypical person joining a gym, and working out one or two or even three times a week, how long until we start to see meaningful or demonstrative results? It's going to take a while. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen in two sessions. It doesn't happen in three sessions. That's why fitness, again, particularly talking about resistance training, um, not that there isn't a cardiovascular component to that, is a long-term, it's a lifelong process. Just because it's been six weeks doesn't mean that automatically, magically something needs to happen. We have to examine those six weeks and really ask um, legitimate questions like, okay, how much training time has there been? How many sets? How many reps? What quality of movement? This is going to tell us where our athlete needs to be and, and, and also where they are right now. So those three phases, you can have an athlete who's still in the introductory phase three months or four months in. Right, that's fine. We just need to recognize it. You can have an athlete who's in that uh, accumulation phase for six months, seven months, eight months, a year, and as long as, in some small ways, they are they are progressing, and as long as there is continuity of the programming, as long as there's consistency, good things will happen. But it's a numbers game that's not necessarily a, attached to time so much as it is the frequency of training, the quality of the exercises, the quality of the coaching, autism fitness certif certification, hint, um, and then the choice of the exercises used, whether they are appropriately modified or, or progressed as well. So you have your introductory phase, you have your accumulation phase, you have your mastery phase, and it could differ by exercise as well, throwing another variable in there. So. The takeaway is that time is not the most, it's a factor, but not the most important factor. Within that time frame, we have to look at those three phases. So when the question comes up from parents or professionals, oh, how long until we see X? We have to meet that question with, well, you know, how much time are we spending training? What is the quality of, uh, quality of the movement? And then looking at the athlete's current, uh, you know, current performance of those exercises and at what point are they going to be independent. Now, if we're talking about um, muscular development, we can't have that conversation as well without talking about nutrition, which is typically beyond the scope of, uh, of what, we, uh, what we cover in Autism Fitness Tuesday training. But nutrition is also a very, nutrition and sleep are also very important components of recovery and the development of, um, of, of lean muscle tissue. So just a thought as well. There are numerous factors. Time is not the only one. Quality of movement, time spent training, total number of sessions are, and those are the three phases of, uh, of, of skill acquisition as it relates to fitness and exercise, um, especially important when we're talking about the autism and neurodivergent uh, life skill athletes. I am Autism Fitness founder Eric Chesson, leading the movement for movement. If and when you are ready to become an Autism Fitness Certified Pro, you can head on over to AutismFitness.com, download the course syllabus for the pro course, for the expert course, even the master course, um, and 
you can take the course worldwide. We will be listing the 2025 practical dates very soon. You can register and start your coursework immediately and then meet me or one of our master pros for your full day hands-on practical. Thanks for watching. Oh, and before you get going, like, subscribe, and I'd love to know how this influences your program or some of the conversations that you have with other parents and professionals. Put those in the comments below, and if there's ever a topic you'd like me to cover in Autism Fitness Tuesday training, put that in the comments also. I'd love to answer your questions. Thanks for watching.